and welcome to Hour One of Patriots Lament. We like to call it the Saturday morning wake-up call. I am Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio. Generally speaking, I'm not much more than a trained chimpanzee pushing buttons over here in exchange for a few bananas every now and then. Uh, joining us here in the studio, the one who gives me the bananas, we've got... You Josh. like green bananas, too. You know what? I really don't. I eat the green bananas because that's what my wife gets. Because oh, when you shop longer. at Sam's, you get them green, and then they they get yellow eventually. Anyway, we're getting... Well, I was kind of saying that uh, the bananas I pay you are green. Ah, oh, yes, this is true. I like <laughs> I like those green bananas. Uh, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises here, the creator and uh, general driving force behind the show. Also in the studio this morning, we have a man of indetermined national descent. Good morning, Claudio. <laughs> Good morning. Hang on a second. Try that again. Good morning. There we go. You got to find the... By the way, you're a pretty smart monk, though. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I... I am a, not quite as hairy a monkey as some of us in the room, but we are. <laughs> I understand you wanted to do something very, very strange for us here this morning, Josh. The the, yeah. for, the format for today's for the first the hour. First of hour, open lines. Open lines. Did we hear that correctly? Open, yeah, we'll actually going answer to the phone. Open up the lines to what people want to talk about. If they call in at 458-TALK, 458-255, outside of the immediate area code, I know we have some listeners down there in Kenai and elsewhere around the, these United States. I believe we might even have an international listener or two, if, uh, depending on when uh, our favorite foreign ex- expatriate calls in uh, at, at a 907 in front of the number, 907-458-0495. We are streaming live online at kfar660.com. And we have our archived shows there as well as on the YouTube channel, which is... Sorry, Patriots no, Lament. Yeah, exactly. Patriots Lament is not the YouTube no, channel. No, YouTube. Radio Free Fair. There you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting ready. Walter Block's going to be on our next uh, hour guest, so I'm filling up some final preparations. All right, so while you are completely distracted and trying to make sure you've got everything ready to go with Walter Block, I'll let people know that he's an Austrian school economist and is considered to be a prominent anarcho-capitalist. And we've talked an awful lot about anarcho-capitalism here on this program. Right, or just the simple voluntarianism. Voluntarism. And the, and the basic idea of voluntarism is that you do not owe anyone anything right and no one can force you to do anything unless there is a voluntary exchange of whatever that might be right so i mean ideas you, like like trading good green bananas right for pushing time. buttons mm-hmm. in the time it takes to, to put the radio show out so that's voluntarism nobody is holding a gun to my head making me be here and nobody should hold the gun to anyone else's head to make them do anything, if they do, and whether it's a actual threat of violence, or violence self, threat of violence, or perceived threat of violence, or using someone else to commit violence, like a government, right? Exactly. Any any of those basically comes down to it is a matter of right and wrong that that is wrong, and there are an awful lot of people who call themselves Christians, who engage in that all the time, right? Because they're not actually doing it to themselves. We're going to actually, that's one of the things I want to talk to Dr. Block today. It's going to be fun. Oh, man, he's good. He. Well, you, you put the line in the water that we're going to open up the lines to the phone calls. We already and someone have, actually we have a nibble. 458 talk is the number. No. Good morning, caller. Who's this? It's Winston. Winston, hey. thanks for calling in. What's on your mind today? Oh, uh, not much. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm new to this computer stuff, you know. And, uh, All right. Uh, I've, I've got a question. Uh uh, uh, somehow or the other, I, I wound up on a website, uh, and uh, it's it's all about this anarcho-capitalism, uh, not voting stuff. And I thought I had the, the 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 name of the website down. At the top of the website up there, they've got a, a, a quote by uh, Thoreau uh, about you know for every thousand people that are chopping at the limbs of the tree of evil. Mm-hmm. There's only one chopping at the root, right? And uh, and I've tried every variation of what I thought was the was the title of the website of uh, you know googling it, trying to get back to it, and I ain't been able to do it. 
What what else is on the website besides that uh, throw a quote? A picture of any sort? Well, they've got a picture of him. They've also got a, uh, 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 they've got a quote about uh, uh, public education is, is used to mold, uh, uh, you know, people's minds and stuff. Uh I just, I just, I just figured that the minutes was on that uh, pretty heavy. I didn't know. Have you tried searching your history? Listen, I'm new to this stuff. No, no, right. no. Okay, no let's, that's what's, let's walk you through. What browser are you using? Um, 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 Mozilla Firefox. Okay, perfect. So if you go to Mozi um, Firefox, you open that up, and the top left tab that says Firefox. Right. You put your little scrollio deal on there, and something a uh, window will open up below it, and you can scroll over there to the part that says history. You don't gotta you don't gotta click on it. Just roll over to history, and then you can go to show all history. Roll it over there, then click on that. Bang! Everything you looked at comes up for you. Ooh, that's a long list. <laughs> well, or you can go to the uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, 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 yeah, it's a uh, uh, no. Like I say, it's. Uh, I was just. Uh, I, I figured y'all might know. Uh, 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 might recognize. That. I didn't know, but I figure there's thousands of sites. There, there are thousands of sites that have even just that one quote by Henry David Thoreau about chopping at the root. So. Yeah, a thousand people of of, of cutting the branches, and and only uh, for every one that's cutting at the root. Of uh, 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 that's uh, uh, and and if I'm not wrong, the the which I've went chopping the root and I've cut the root and uh, 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 several other things. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try that, but I'll have to wait till the radio program's over because uh, uh, I can't listen to the radio and um, 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 run the generator at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll be good. Thanks. Uh, I. Uh, before you go, I enjoyed. Okay. I got to meet Winston. Um, two was it? Oh, just a week ago. Yeah, yeah. Wow, seems like a long time already. It was about a week ago, down at the uh, Deltana Fair, had a great time, and I just wanted to tell you publicly for everyone, it was great to meet you, and you're fantastic. Right. I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it, it was my pleasure, uh, uh, and uh, I not only got to meet you. I also got to meet um, John Golf and oh. Cecily. Nice. Yeah, it was it, it, it was beautiful. Uh, 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 we just had a forum for people to come speak, and we were tickled pink to have you there. Well, can, thank you. Can I ask you a question, Winston? Based yeah. on your on your time down there at the Deltana uh, Fair, it was like a, a kind of a mini Freedom Fest you guys are having there, and I understand that uh, Joe Miller spoke on the Constitution. He was supposed to speak on the Constitution. It was, uh, um, uh, um, to my assessment, he spoke mainly about politics, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and we were trying to avoid politics. But uh, like I say, he mainly spoke on politics. Uh, you know, but that's uh, uh, we were proud to have him there too. Uh, uh, we had. Uh, um, 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 John Coghill, and we had uh, Dunn Levy, two state senators there. We had uh, Russ Millett. Uh, we, we, we had a number of people, Mike Chambers, uh, Barbara Anderson. Uh, uh, just, we had just a, a large number of people that were knowledgeable about a lot of different things speaking. Uh, um, and it was, uh, it was a good thing. Cool. Yeah. And I stand before my maker at the end of time. And uh, 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 I ain't gonna have to hang my head in shame and tell him I did nothing. Hey, Jim, uh, our our friend Jim O'Connor messaged me on Facebook that you might want to check out strike strikethroot dot com. Does that sound familiar? Strike the root. Okay, got you covered. So it's strike Thanks, sir. strike dash the the dash root dot com, and right at the top, there's a photo. And a quote by one Henry David Thoreau. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Striking at the root. Thank Stri you, so sir. The, so the, the name of the website, strike-the-root. Dash dash 
Okay. Got you covered. Hey, thanks, Winston. Thanks, yeah. Winston. Thanks, yeah, Jim. Appreciate the phone call. You ready to take another one? Yeah. 458 Do Talk this. is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Lee. Lee. Good morning. What's on your mind today? Well, you guys might want to kick around the the tax cap that Fairbanks and the and the vicinity has in place for many years, thanks to the IPA. Uh-huh. It, they've got a booth out at the fair that uh, it's another every two years it has to go before the voters, and we don't get enough signatures on the petition. It don't happen, and I know you guys have mixed opinions about voting. But how do you feel about the tax cap? And I urge everybody that goes to the fair to try to seek out the ITA booth and at least if they favor the tax cap, sign the darn thing so we can uh, at least have a chance at keeping it. Yeah. And so that's my comment. If you guys want to comment on it, I'd sure like to hear what you have to say about it. We talked a little bit about that when Matt um, Matt Wanton last was on week. Here. Was that, that last week? It was last week. And you, had a, you had a busy week, Josh. Yes. That was just last week. It and seems months. What, what would happen, and, and while well, I've got Lee, Lee on the phone, Lee, you still there? Oh, I do believe. Okay, no. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. What would happen if instead of instituting and forcing them to have a tax cap, we removed it entirely? Remove the cap? Oh, and let them tax us whatever they wanted to. Well, do you want to get the bill? Well... His his point is if and that was something that Matt Want had talked about. If if that was so, people would be a lot more interested in shutting down taxes because the way we have it now, we're kind of in a lull with this tax cap. We're like, oh, we're safe, which I don't necessarily even understand this because it's not a it's not a true it's not a true cap. No, it's not at all. It's not a spending cap. It's not anything they can they still basically do whatever they want because they can raise their budget and once they do they can raise the tax rate would you care to speculate on the hundreds of millions of dollars how many of those there are that have been saved by this cap over the the life of life of the cap year over a decade i don't know how much money has necessarily been saved when we hadn't look at how much it has grown matt one on here even he with the tax cap look at how much it has grown with the tax cap with the tax cap it is i agree quadrupled in the last three years i think well, that or is it 10 your years? question is what the hell might happen to it if you didn't have the cap well what, what would happen if you didn't have the cap is when it grows people would be outraged there it is aaron bennett just signing just uh, joining us hey, in the studio here good morning aaron See, pe- people allow allow the tax to keep growing and growing because they have a cap, because they had a say in it. I would like well, the tax cap to be like I'm, zero. Okay, well, I all I can say is, well, we if, if we, no, we all just said, comment we, on your comments because we, I don't want to see it go become outrageous. We all just admitted that it keeps going higher and higher. Well. To some limited degree, yes, but that's what the cap does. It puts a little bit of constraint on these flake politicians that think government can provide everything for everybody. But if if they raise their spending, they can raise their tax. Lee, let me ask you this. If a mugger came up and stuck a gun in your face and you said, okay, you can rob me, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to put a restraint on how much you can rob me. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is it, it doesn't restrain, because if they raise their spending, they can raise their tax base. Right, so all the tax cap actually does is make people complacent. What, what would be a better alternative would to be have a spending cap, where basically you said, this is how much you can spend, you can't go over that. Well, I don't see anybody proposing that, and so that's not a realistic alternative. At this time, the best thing that we can do to try and reel in government is to keep the tax cap in place and then if somebody but it's not working well and we've you, proposed you've got to give me a definition of not working because nobody can tell me where the tax on property would be today if we hadn't had a cap on for the last decade. no but we can tell you where it is today based on where it has uh, with with the tax cap it is still grown at an outrageous rate and therefore the tax Hello? cap is not working yeah, well, that depends on your definition of not working. But it you're, spec- you're speculating, up. Lee. You're speculating that it would have been worse. It might even have been less. Okay, the tax okay, cap I'm right now. What? I'm going to remove myself from this conversation. I just made my comment. Okay. The rational, the rational voters of Fairbanks, maybe they can make a decision as to whether or not they want to support it. And I urge somebody to come up with a better solution. 
but let's not let this one fall through the crack and then and then grow and grasp for a better solution. Yeah, That's wait, all wait, I wait. have to Hang say. On a second. Have a good day. All right, Lee. Thanks. I did give a better solution, a spending cap. We have for several years when when we ran for borough for some reason, we came up with several several different things besides the quote unquote tax cap, and all of them were like, oh, well, that won't work because we have a tax mm -hmm. uh, a mill rate cap or whatever. It no, is. it's not a mill rate cap. It is no, a, it's yeah, right. It's it the, is a cap based. It's it's <laughs> some kind of formula basically that says that they can still grow it, but only if they get new construction. Now that that new construction, it only adds. It never takes away. Right. Think about the Captain Bartlett Inn. Just a few years ago, we had a huge hotel right over there on Airport Way. It's not gone any. Uh, it's not there. It is gone. Did they remove that from the from the tax cap formula? No. No. They it, just keep growing with new construction. If it was a real formula, they would take away any time you turn down a building. It does not. Now, here's the, what the so-called rational. You got to do the air quotes with me. Rational voters. There you go. Thank you. This is what the rational voters did a few years ago. We, the, the same folks, the ITA, put out a proposal to ratchet down the tax cap a little bit by saying, you know what, we're not going to allow you to grow for new construction this year. And simply that one little tiny t twerk, just to change it ever so slightly and say, we want you to keep within the means you've got right now, not grow it at all. The folks over there at the borough circulated their own competing petition, and the rational voters, they, you got to use the air quotes again, rational mm -hmm. voters chose to go ahead and allow the borough to keep on growing with the tax cap. Right. Right now, the tax cap is as much as they want, uh, because if they can raise the spending, they can raise the cap, so it doesn't matter. It's just like the the... The ceiling that you have for national debt, they keep raises like an elevator Perfect. instead of a ceiling. Right. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't forestall or stop spending. But Josh, it's what we have, and we vote on it. <laughs> it's be, you know. It's because right. We there's all, another we problem because we vote. Other people get to vote on what my taxes are. Right. I pay that, like seventy five hundred dollars a year for my place. That's that's for your for your house. Right. I don't believe that you that also, is you also pay, fair. You also pay on your business. Yes. Several thousand. So, I mean, how is it fair? Just because my place, supposedly, according to them, might be worth more than well, no. Joe Neighbor, he might use the services three times more than I do, because we don't use any except for any. Well, actually, we don't, I don't even think we use any. Do they plow your roads? No. Um, you don't live in, do you live in a road service? Oh, yeah. There can never be a fair tax anyway because there's always a taxpayer and a tax recipient. Yep. So any way you look at it, no matter how you write the tax code, it will never be fair. That's just, you're not being a rational voter, Aaron. No, a rational voter, no. Not spending me. limit. Let's have a spending limit. Let's start with that. I, I mean, that's. I would never be happy with such a thing. I would be happy with... No tax and no Gosh, you're only going to be happy when they don't have any money. Exactly, because <laughs> that would mean they don't have my money. You're obviously not a rational voter. But a <laughs> no, I'm not actually. <laughs> <laughs> but having a, a spending limit, I mean, the tax cap does not stop them. They raise their spending, then they can raise the tax. So where is this limit? And. I don't remember what the exact words are, but I know Natalie Howard's talked about it on here, how much it has, just in the last so many years since we've even had it, it's gone up hundreds of thousands of dollars, hasn't it? Like doubled? Yes, yes, it has. So what limit is there? There's no, the idea that the, that this tax cap is limiting is not rational because it's not true. It doesn't limit anything. <coughs> and to say, well, we have saved millions of dollars because of it says who? speculation but josh there's no proof josh for that. you're missing one point we vote for it exactly other people that don't own property vote how much i can pay on my property but that's the that's the fair way to vote isn't it sure. to allow everybody a voice even if they don't have any any dog in the fight as long as we get the word out and get all the rational educated people out of the vote See, what i would really like to do is i'd like to have an opportunity to vote about what's going on in california because I have so much say in what the taxpayers of California do, right? 
I think I ought to be able to vote on what's going on in California. It's the same principle. You're allowing people who don't have a dog in the fight, who don't pay a cent in taxes. To decide how much To decide have. how much you have to pay. And even, you know, you hear the argument, oh, the renters still pay the tax because then the, the, the rent goes up. You've heard people say oh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that may be true. But they don't see it coming out of their pocket immediately. I mean, if somebody is renting, let's, let's face it. They're not making long-term decisions in the first place. Right, they're not actually the one writing the check to the borough. Yeah. The property owner is. Yeah. He okay. may not be able to get all of his property tax value or tax that he has to pay out of the renter. It might not be worth it to the renter. But there's no decision-making. I mean, that's a negotiation that the renter and the renter have back and forth. They have a negotiation process where they can say, I want this much, I do or won't pay that much, or I will pay that much. You don't get to do that with the borough government. You will pay this much. Okay. They tell you how much it's worth, right? and then they tell you how much you have to pay. Oh, well, no. There's a cap on it. There's, no, there's not a cap on how much it's worth. I mean, you look at how much oh. just the value of the property has gone up in this town. Well, the entire rest of the country has seen a huge reduction in the real estate value. Huh. You think it has anything to do with um, when they go to sell off the houses at the um, stated value, they always get about half of what they say they're worth when they auction people's houses off? Hmm. Hmm. They never get anywhere near what they say they're worth? That, that would imply that they're not actually worth what they say they're worth. Yeah, but it has nothing to do with the market. It's not rational. So yeah. the whole thing, is, let's just put this to rest. The tax cap, it's pure... Air, air money, I mean, there's no factual basis saying, well, we have saved this much money, but there is a factual basis to look that the borough spending has gone up, 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 way up. So the tax cap does nothing. You know, it's almost the same argument for government in general. If we didn't have them, it would be worse. Right, because we've seen all the times in history where we haven't had government that everything's just gone to crap, right? So we're proposing, since, you know, let's give an alternative, a spending cap. Tell them how much they can or can't spend, and then every year we'll make it lower. <laughs> Until it's zero. <laughs> That's irrational, Josh. <clears throat> You're not being a rational voter. We have two lines on hold, and about uh, two minutes before the Fox News at the bottom of the hour. Good morning, Already? caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is Carl. Carl. I think... Um, <laughs> The best comparison to our local or state government is compared to that Castro guy in uh, Ohio. The only thing he didn't do was um, release his uh, captives every day to go back home to their parents. <laughs> but they probably didn't have any parents either. They were probably just great people. But anyways, that if you look at it, they torture you in school, you know, they sexually abuse you, you know, they bond you, uh, just, it, it's, why isn't our government being arrested and sentenced for a thousand years? You know, it's perfect comparison. Yes, actually, that is a good point, and I can't believe this is, let's write this down, Carl, that was a good point. Why aren't they arrested? Yeah. We're going to ask Dr. Block about That's that. That's a very good question. <laughs> All right, we got about uh, 30 seconds or so. Good morning, caller. You're next. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, what's Hi, on Randy. your mind? Hey, long time no here. Yeah. Um, I was just looking at the uh, borough tax cap here, and some of the exceptions are where they can exceed what was gathered in last year is the CPI and uh, property improvements and any appropriation made to secure interest for the bonds and uh, taxes required to fund services authorized by voter approved ballot issues and then fourth uh, funding of new judgments entered against Fairbanks North Star Borough and finally uh, special appropriations necessary on an emergency basis to fund unavoidable expenses ensuring the public peace health and safety anyway my question though is if we did come up with a petition and a ballot issue that would take away some of these exceptions, you know, actually limit the spending, would you vote for it in spite of your pledge it's not to vote? It's already been tried, Randy, and the voters rejected that. No, my question is, if they did have it on the ballot, we got a new new thing on the ballot to really cut the spending, to limit the spending, would you vote for it in spite of your pledge to not vote? No, because I pledge not to vote. You're still... 
even even with less, you're still saying that they have the right to take some. Right. And I don't believe they have the right to take any. So Be why right would back. I sanction that? And welcome back to hour one of Patriot Cement. We like to call it the Saturday morning wake up call because uh, if you listen for just a few minutes, your blood will get pumping. Your Heart really racing so. and you know, can generally raise your blood pressure. And it will cause you. To it's raise. good blood um, pressure, though. Exactly, Randy. Are you Me? still on the line? Yeah, I am. Oh, oh. That's that side. Just listening. <laughs> All right. Uh, any, oh, anyway, since I have an opportunity, um, I feel that we are charged the stewardship, the people, you know, of citizenry, the world population, you know, national us, and just like we don't let our car fall apart, we got to tweak it and maintain it. Uh, I think we should do the same with our state of affairs, and uh, you can see what happens when irresponsible voting occurs, like, for instance, the irresponsible voting in 2008 that allowed Mark Begich to get in there, who was the man from Alaska who gave us, who gave America Obamacare. Now we're saddled with even more what's, what's, government. What's responsible voting, Randy? I mean, I don't, you're, you can't c- compare it to a car because a car is a good thing, and it's also an inanimate object. Government is not an inanimate object. It's a very... It's an object that has everything to do with your life daily, pounding on you, it takes from you. Cars don't. They give something to you. Do you think that somebody else should have to come fix your car? Or Uh that you should mandate Uh that somebody Uh else should have Uh to fix their car? Uh, no, no, I should. That's be what you're saying. My own car. But 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 you see, Randy, when you said that we have been charged with stewardship. Yeah. Who charged us with stewardship? Have you said, Steve, I want you to make decisions for me? Well, no. I would hope you make good I, decisions. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. You would hope that I make would I make good decisions on your behalf? Yes. Uh, for I'm, I'm dumbfounded. The, the decision of who to vote for in 2008 for U.S. Senate, all of us needed to watch each other's back. We needed desperately to not let Mark Baggett to get in there to give the 60th vote in the U.S. Senate, which would allow Obamacare to oppress us all. That affected me, affected you, affected all your kids. It's a disaster having him in the U.S. Senate. And I'm not blaming him because anybody has a right to throw their hat in the ring. But we have to exercise stewardship and put on our thinking cap and vote correctly. Wait, well, so you, wait, you're telling me that voting correctly would have been to put a, a convicted felon back in office? Well, it's several steps. In the primary, the proper thing, which I did, was to vote for Dave Cuddy against Ted Stevens. But when he lost, the only option left in November of 2008 was to vote for Ted Stevens. And if he, if his conviction maintained, we'd kick him out, and the Republican governor would have appointed another conservative in his place. That was what people with their thinking cap on would do. That's what I did. Randy, uh-huh. you're admitting that voting is aggression. I didn't say that. Well, sure you did. There you go. Well, well, yeah, yeah. When you vote wrong, when you put a guy like Mark Begich in, yeah, that's horrible. And what about the people on the other side that want Obamacare? Isn't it aggression against them? I mean... No, because people that want Obamacare, they can move to Massachusetts and get all the Obamacare they want. Well, people that don't want Obamacare can move to Chile and not have it all they want. Yeah, but I'd rather not have it here in Alaska. Well, they would rather not move to Massachusetts. I don't want to move to Massachusetts either. I want to be right here with no Obamacare, but now we got Obamacare courtesy of our own senator that we foisted on the whole nation because we did not do enough stewardship. And no, 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 no. This, this is so ridiculous that we're not controlling the government, government enough. You can't control the government. There shouldn't. No one should be able to tell you what you can and can't do anyways. It's a false premise to say that we are the government or we have a stewardship with the government. No, we don't. There are a bunch of thieves. It's a gang of thieves. That's like saying, well, you know, I have good stewardship with uh, the the mob or the mafia over here. I got If I don't pay them enough, they're not going to give me the right protection. That's the exact same thing. We don't have stewardship with, I mean, stewardship's like, a, I mean, where do you even get that word? I don't even understand what you're talking about. There is nothing to do. None of this has anything to do with having good people in Washington. What is a good person in Washington? They're all thieves, because all of them vote to take something from you and give it to someone else. Yeah, but I'm not blaming the politicians. I'm blaming the people that put the bad ones in. They're all bad, Randy. There's no such thing. And you even said, if anyone has the right to go after it, then how can you blame anyone for voting for anyone? Because it's everyone's right to go after it. And you just told us you admitted... You admitted that with Steve, with Ted Stevens' corruption charges, the fact that he was already convicted on corruption charges, that you were going to be sending a convicted criminal 
back to Washington if they voted correctly according to your view. And, so, yeah, and the I other sure thing that you're saying that. is that our steward, you're saying that we have a stewardship, and then you admit that you would vote for basically the lesser of two evils. You have said that before too. So our duty and stewardship is to vote for evil. The lesser of the evil. No, no, yeah. no. Whoa, that, wait, lesser of doesn't it's, mean jack. It's still evil. It's still it evil. It's still evil. I mean, so I can say the same thing about Mussolini or Hitler, because Hitler killed more people. Well, I would have voted for Mussolini. Well, I, you would have voted for Mussolini, huh? Well, I. Well, you would have voted, voted for, for Hitler. No, those are your Hitler two can't. choices. Those are your two choices. One's the lesser of two evil. Who's killed less people? Mussolini. Well, by your theory, then Mussolini would be your man. Well, now at some point you just have to run across the border and escape the whole situation if it's that bad. No, oh, we're talking. Oh, hey. oh, oh, Randy. No, at some point you quit <laughs> participating, period, because it is that bad. No, Here's I my point, Randy. This is Claudio Gomes. Uh, people are being voting our government for you no know, 200 years. Uh, when you ever see get better, it's always you vote to worse and get worse and worse. Be, because you, you vo instead vote for Satan, you vote for for one of these demons that because it's less <laughs> of the evil. So things get worse every time, every single time, and uh, you are voting yourself on the mass. Well, not all of them. Are, some of them are good people. Like I used to send money to North Carolina to Jesse Helms every year before he passed away, because he was trying to reverse the direction of sliding toward tyranny and socialism. And I wish he was still alive today to apply that pressure that he applied back then and we do have some good people that get us in the right direction toward less government and that's what we have to p do our share to try to accomplish that i understand but uh, like we had ron paul but what he could do he was the lone vote there b amongst hundreds of people have one guy that is good yeah uh, i understand your point but it, that's what happened with vote you always have the bad people there they overwhelm the good people so it doesn't matter you can't vote in well, it's, uh, there's always going to be bad people and good people putting their hat in the ring. It's up to the people. Randy, at, at the end of the day, the people are still going to vote. That's and right. And they're never, ever, ever going to vote for less money to themselves. Well, that's Our system is theft. People are never going to stop yeah, yeah, taking money from each other. They're never going to stop coveting each other. You're and right. And they're never going to stop lending support to it because they were involved in it. You're right. All of us have seeds of evil, and some people have a lot more evil than others. And there's people that actually vote to to conk somebody else over the head and take their money and give it to somebody else. There are bad citizens. There's no doubt about it. You're right about that. But there are some good citizens that got not so much it's evil only, in them that vote for good people that try to reverse this trend. If only we could make people stop sinning, Randy. Well, we we try. We got to all try to do that. That's what the whole. That's why we're here on that's Earth. That's what I Jesus think. said. That's what Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, Jesus the whole said, reason to be here on Earth is to stop try other, people, other people. Try to make other people stop sinning. Well, to to, to first take care of ourselves and then try to. And that's the, the end. Huh? That's the end. Take care of yourself. Take you the log out of your own eye. Jesus, right, exactly. I believe You're Jesus right. actually right did that. say that. He didn't did he? actually. That's interesting. You're absolutely take, take right the, about instead that. Instead of going to your brother with a little and saying, "Hey, look, brother, you got a speck in your eye." Jesus said, you know what? Stop. Take the log out of your own eye. I, I agree with that. The greatest part is that you're advocating using force on people for righteousness. I'm it's advocating sick. less force from the government. I do not want Obamacare. I don't want that. I, I don't horrible. either. I but, think it's stupid. But people voted for it, Randy. I know, I know. That's why we got to do, double our efforts to try to get Mark Beggins out of there next time. Oh, my gosh. So we can uh, put who in there? Dave Cuddy or anybody else that's better than Mark Baggage. How about Kid Cuddy? Okay, how how tell me how Lisa Markowski be is better than Baggage? Oh, she's about ten times better than. How? Baggage. She voted for Patriot Act. Any bill that's against Fourth Amendment, she votes for. She consistently sides with the Democrats when Baggage goes against the Democrats. The very Democrat that you're railing against is more of a Republican than the Republican. Well, she Lisa Murkowski voted against Obamacare in 2009. Mark Baggage voted for it to cast the deciding vote. 
And I didn't say that Lisa Murkowski is 100 times better. We need a person that's 100 times better than Begich, but she is at least 10 times better than Begich. The person that's 100 times better than Begich won't run for office because he knows it's a system of theft and violence, and he wants no part in it. He wants no part in telling other people how to live their lives. That is a person that's 100 times better than Mark Begich. Okay, I'll take someone that's 90 times better. Whatever. Anything better than Begich. Let's get, get out of there. I think, uh, honestly, though, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're focused only on the politics and you're only focused on person to person to person and you get away from the principle randy you get sucked into it would you ever commit an act of rape randy no what if the person was already tied up no and you didn't actually have well, i'd untie them well what if oh, okay but but you see when you go out there and you participate in the system you are lending support to it i'm voting to untie the girl <laughs> but what if you lose the vote well, that's Does that make tied up? Then, oh, and then it's okay then because no, you took a vote no. on it. I'll, I'll sneak around and un. There, bond but there is bond. no untying. There's no untying. There's no sneaking around. We're not. We're talking about the government. It's a system of force and violence. Why do you want to be a part of it? Just so you can force and force someone else to do what you want. It's not correct. I believe in incremental good. I believe in good. Period. There's I only, believe in doing just there's a only bit. incremental evil. There is no such thing as incremental good. It is an inconsistency. Well, that means taking away evil in incremental bits. That's what incremental good means. How's Hasn't that worked. working out for you? Hasn't worked in all of well, history. Well, wait, 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 maybe maybe Randy has an example. When has it worked, Randy? Well, the, I've mentioned this before. When they passed the Tap Hartley Act back in '49 or so, over Truman's veto, they passed it and reduced some of the onerous labor union regulations that had bound up this country at that time it was really bad people were striking all over the place tying up industry stopping production and they finally passed some laws that kind of reversed that and went in the other direction we got some freedoms back for how long well up to the present day it's still in effect that they had in, included in the taft hartley act the right for uh, the right to work laws which a lot of the states have you know michigan recently got right to work laws we still don't have it here in alaska we're still under the all tied up, bound up in that respect, but you know there has been incremental improvement here and there, and a lot of incremental going the wrong, other bad way. But we got to keep our shoulder to the wheel and keep trying to go the right way. Yes, but uh, who is winning? The bad, the bad things are are getting worse, or you? Yeah, there's bad <laughs> getting worse, like Obamacare. That's worse. That's way worse. I, I know, but I live here in the United States for 12 years, about, and. Since I moved here, ever the government got worse and worse and worse under Republicans and Democrats. And I, I don't see, and same happened where I come from, Brazil, the governments always get worse. That's yeah, uh, true. Yeah, they so do. You, are voting, you are voting for that. So if you don't <laughs> vote for that, you're just taking away your consent to the government because it doesn't work anyway why you vote for well, I think it got a little better in, in Soviet Union, for instance. I mean, you got to admit that was a little. I mean, they had chaos and everything, but I think it's a little better than under Stalin, where millions of people were being killed, and the brutal, oppressive Soviet system is has improved somewhat. Certainly, it's improved in China, from Mao Zedong killing 60 million of his people to a pretty much of a free enterprise system. Still got oppression, but it's a lot better. But in Soviet <laughs> Union, Union, they didn't vote; that they just collapsed on the, their own weight. Well, they voted a little bit in Russia, I guess, but they got the vote there. But All right, Randy, thanks for the call. Appreciate you, brother. Keep listening. Did you want to take another call? Yeah. 458 Talk um, is a number. Good morning, caller. Your next is this. Hi. Hi, who is this? This is Ron. Ron, what's on your mind today? Generally, I agree with you folks. I think I just heard you say that you thought that the tax cap was a waste of time. I would totally agree if you said that the borough was nothing but a kleptocracy. Oh, we've said that several times. And um, I'd like to hear your proposal, step by step, how we can make any kind of improvements in our own lifetime. At the uh, borough level? Yeah, yeah, well, start with the borough, but if you got a better idea, keep going. Well, I would start at the borough and go to the top, but... Um, First, you have to start with your family, Josh. Because a lot of these principles that we talk about are, are played out in your, in your family life and in the financial choices that you make in your family. That's true. I, I don't have a step-by-step -step program in front of me right at the minute, but, I mean, we've talked about several things. Let's just start with the spending cap. Why couldn't we have, instead of the tax cap, because it is just, it's a gang of thieves, just a bunch of good old boy clubs. Okay, we we, we agree is. on that part now. You know, if you want a spending cap, tell me step-by-step -step how we get there. 
I don't know exactly all the steps, well, but, but I know that the wasting uh, our Saturday mornings here. Mm, no, no, wait, not. hang on a second. Now, how are you? How are we wasting the Saturday morning? Because we don't have a plan all the way out. We, I mean, we have a shotgun approach. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the point that do. he's trying to get to is that you would have to vote for that. Right. That's, huh, maybe that is. You know, the you know the Cuban people have been treated rotten for a long time, step by step. What can they do? Resist. Withdraw consent. Five hundred and twelve people telling uh, how many millions what to do. Three hundred. Yeah, we we all agree on those things. Now, what, what what's our steps? Where do we go? What what action do we take? Well, for one, we don't think that taking the action of participating in their political system is the right way to go about it. If we would all stop participating in the system, they would be delegitimized. It's a fact. They would be de delegitimized, and they would stop having. They would know that they're not legitimate anymore. They don't they would care. Know. All, they would. They're, that's why they, they keep they, telling they, us they to care participate. A lot. They care a lot. Participate. Participate. Because when you lose your legitimacy, you're a dictatorship. Look what happens when you mock them. They come unfreaking glued. And they go after you. Yeah. And they and they they reveal themselves to be the bullies they actually are. Have you ever stood up to a bully before? Yeah. So how do you stand up to a bully by participating in what the bully tells you to do? Well, there's there's a lot of steps. You know, here here's just one little one. Um, if you're laughing at a pompous ass, he falls apart. He cannot tolerate that. If we taught that in the schools, that when somebody starts yes. acting like a bully or a yeah. tyrant, that everybody starts laughing at him. Yeah. They, That's they, they just come on, they, they fall apart. They can't function. And then they, they're shown for what they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's a good start with the yeah, borough. I mean, we should, when these people get on Steve's radio show or whatever, or they're running for office or whatever, they just need to be exposed for what they are. You should laugh at them and say, who, I mean, for the first, what I like to ask them is, who are you to rule me? What, well, gives, what makes you so good or better to rule me? The assembly meeting doing that? I have before. Well, okay. but, I, but, but the reason I quit going is because I was all one time. You don't get to ask them any questions or anything, and I would think that if, I would start going back if, for one, I didn't have to sit in this little chair with them sitting above me like they're my gods, and then feeling like I'm begging them for something. They filled that floor in years ago. Well, they still you, they still sit above you quite a bit. Yeah. Well, we're all, all our chairs are on the same level now. Okay, yeah. yeah. Answer the, yeah. your question about the steps. I think uh, Josh and uh, Aaron are doing the steps already. It's try to to educate people that to take away their consent. What's happening in the revol American Revolution? Uh, they finally people got educated enough and and got in consent to take their their. Uh, they, they would give consent. They took away their consent from the British, and that's what needs to happen. That's the only way to, to happen is take away the consent, and that happens slowly, slowly, and it's painfully slowly, too. And peacefully resist them. I mean, one of the things I've, I've thought about a lot is when, if they would have passed the borough wood ban or whatever it was, and they would have, I wonder, I have wondered how many people who think that they have the right to heat their home the way they want to, how many of them would have actually resisted that and said, I'm burning wood? I mean, it takes a step-by-step -step personal step. It's not what can we do to them. It's a personal step. What are you going to do yourself? And part of that is to resist them and withdraw your consent from them. If you're going to participate with their game, they're going to win every time because they have more friends than we do. If we remove our consent from them and mock them in the process, they will collapse. It's, it, Claudio has a good point. That's what already happened here. That's how we got America. Well, not America necessarily. That's how the states freed themselves from the British government. They withdrew their consent. They didn't vote it out. They didn't do it. They just said, we're done. No more, no more British takes government. Our money to create people on their side of the balance. Yes, yes, they do. They do, and that's and why and one of the reasons why we were talking that? about the. How do you fight that? By by going and participating in their games, or by trying to deny them the money? Well, let me let me ask you this one: If we had a, a majority of decent people on the assembly, would anything change? No, because government 
has power and power is corrupt corrupt and you people always start to to vote they have to vote for to give away stuff if not people are not going to do it not going to vote for them as long as an entity this is my personal belief as long as an entity has the power to tax you it then you're screwed as long as an entity has the power to tax you they have the power to destroy you and as long as they have the power to tax you they will and that's thievery that's taking from you so they have all the power over you but so who actually well, first said the power to tax they're going to destroy us they're, yes. is that what you're saying yes unless we take away their power to tax well i'm going to list, listen to you guys day after day here and you tell us step by step what we got to do wait wait, wait, wait clearly wait. what's going on now isn't changing hang anything hang on hang on no, why, why do we have to tell you what to do well you're, you're what are you there, suggesting you're good, you got the microphone you can talk to us you got the you you know you say you're unhappy with what's going on who else is going to tell us well i personally don't want to be presumptuous enough to think i can tell anyone exactly how they should live their lives no but that's not what i'm asking i'm saying how can we resist this government all right now that's you yeah, know good what good question that is a very good question and i will from here forward because you know we have gotten off of what our initial statement mm -hmm. was when we started this show we're going to get back on track let's start talking about how do we resist these people how yeah. do we remove our consent you know i'm going to take the blame we've let the show bass back and forth and on and on and lost the main focus and that is to resist the people that rule us and that is what we should do we're Americans we are Americans American was America was founded the states were free the colonists were founded. their stated goal was I am free you don't tell me what to do I am not a subject would you agree that's one of the first things we should teach little kids yes and I believe that mom and dad teach your teach little your kids, kids that you should not be ruled by other people what a bully looks like smells like and behaves like yes you know what i was we were having i was having this discussion with some friends and i haven't actually participated in this yet but i think a really good start and this doesn't sound very nice but i don't like these people when they call in and our guests on our local shows or whatever we should call them on we should call the guests or the the phone lines or whatever when they say we're taking calls we're talking to mr kawasaki or mr whoever and we should put, call them on the spot and say just call them for what they are so you're a worthless human why are you ruling over me and when they say oh we're working really hard you know well, what exactly is your work scott kawasaki what do you do what have you done productive for the people of this community what do you actually produce what jobs are you giving no what do you you're act, all you're doing is stealing from one entity and giving to your base so they'll vote you in the next time he constantly rewards the people who are tightening their stranglehold on the ballot box yeah no that's an excellent point i think part of here's let's just try this this week people who are listening if any politician comes on steve's show let's call him up and mock him and call him out for what they are the bullies and laugh at them. Willing tool of the insatiable machine. <laughs> nice. Thanks for That's the call. A good one. Appreciate that. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're next. Who's this? Hi, this is Tim. Tim, what's on your mind? Well, I almost forgot my uh, train of thought after you know thirty minutes. But uh, hey, we're trying, first, man. Thanks for your persistence. At least we've gotten first, we got to the phones today. <laughs> yeah. First, yeah. First point here is uh, vote Mussolini. Okay. Or U.S. Uh, Senate uh, of Alaska. <laughs> he has a proven track record of alienating everybody and toppling government. Whoa. Mm, nice. Good job. So, yeah. you know, there, there you have your ideal candidate. Secondly, I was at the uh, work session at the uh, assembly on Thursday, and they were talking about property rights. And as an example of someone who has a interest beyond the the general public i.e. has a property interest in an issue or whatever uh irene broker the borough uh lawyer went and said that she has a property right interest in her job what yes so wait who is she again the, the uh, borough is attorney this, the borough attorney so saying that she then says that if she has a property right to her job, then that means she owns it. And basically, as are us as the supposed employers, 
have no right to go and say, well, let's see, we have reorganized the, the system and whatnot and have decided that we no longer desire your services. And we can't do that because she has a property right interest in that job and we have to fund it in perpetuity. Okay, that's, that's one of those positive rights, or yeah. a stated right that doesn't actually exist because you don't have the right to a job. I mean, because if that's true, that means you have the right to whatever job you want with whoever you want to take that job with. And that's true as long as they agree. But if they don't, I mean, if you have the right to that job, like you, actually you just said that, then that means no one can tell you you can't have it. Yeah, if, if so her, you know, well, let's put it this way. When they go and they put words out, especially if they put two words together, <laughs> they don't necessarily mean what they mean in English separate. So who knows necessarily what she was saying, but when she said that she has a property right interest in her job, that entails, in my mind, ownership, and it means uh, that basically the employer, us, have no, you know, no right to say yay or nay on her job because she owns it. It's hers. Yeah. She has the property right to it. Huh. That's interesting. I've never heard of uh, your job being a property right, especially when you're a government employee. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> That's the attitude you get, though, every single time you see the firefighters or the policemen show up in uniform down at the city hall whenever they talk about cutting benefits or not fully funding or not increasing. You know, it, isn't that intimidation if you show up? You know, for instance, if, if I got 20 of my friends to show up and we all wore the same thing, even if it was just a simple black T-shirt with some brown pants, wouldn't we be in some kind of an intimidating block by doing that? You know, if, if the government employees think that they have a right to our money, they think that they deserve it? Well, the last time uh, in the city that they uh, had testimony on uh, the police uh, union's uh, uh, contract, do you want to know how many uh, people came there and testified against the uh, proposal? No. One, me. Oh, there you have it. <laughs> Brother, thanks for the call. We're up against the clock. Fox News here on the way. Hour two, Patriots Lament coming up right here on the local talk radio. We are KFAR 660 on your AM dial. We're also online at KFAR660.com and on your smartphone with the free TuneIn Radio app. Hey, hey, this song is for us. Welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio. I'm Steve Floyd, the person who is paid to come in here and make this happen. I am not the creator or the owner of the material presented in this show. I just wanted to be clear about that because people sometimes call my show during the week and take me to task for things that you say. When he's in the studio, <laughs> Sorry, the Bennett brothers, that. and that's okay. We've got Aaron Bennett, and we've got Josh Bennett, of course, the, uh, the ones who came up with the idea and who have put their money where their mouth is to make this thing happen. Uh, Josh, good morning. Good morning. Aaron, good morning. Good morning. And uh, joining us also in the studio, we've got Claudio Gomez. Good morning. A person of indeterminate, non-American background. Ooh. That's right. Actually, I have determined that I just don't like to say it. <laughs> yeah. So, let's get to this. All right. Hey, we've got a special guest on the line right now, a Dr. Walter Block, a Austrian school economist and actually considered by many to be a prominent anarcho-capitalist, currently oh, holding yeah. the Harold E. Wirth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair in Economics at the J.A. Butt School of Business at Loyola University, New Orleans. Is that correct, sir? Boy, that was a mouthful. You did it very well. Well, thank <laughs> you for joining us on the line. And even importantly, Senior Fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. We've had... Walter, I almost called you Dr. Block, but I will strive to remember to call you Walter. We've had some wonderful guests on this show, um, even Lou Rockwell, um, Bob Murphy, Richard Mayberry, Tom Woods. Sir, we are very proud to have you on. Thank you very much. We've got you right up there on the top of the list of awesome guests, and you haven't even been on yet. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to join that crew, and, and you also. Thank you very much. Um, let's get right after it. Um, you, the things you're kind of controversial in your libertarian 
views, um, even especially, I would say, in the libertarian community. One of your deals that you wrote about uh, defending the undefensible was fantastic. I mean, that uh, is so good, and especially with when you're speaking with uh, so-called Christians who like to decide how other people ought to live and are willing to use force to force them to live that way. Your, that book was so good at explaining why that is not correct, why it is wrong to use violence to force people how they should be. And also, what I, what I really would like to talk to you about is your writing toward, was a, I think it was a speech that you gave, toward a libertarian theory of guilt and punishment for the crime of statism. Now we've talked about on the show here several times that government, for one, should not, well, we don't believe in government because we're anarcho-capitalists, we're anarchists, but government should not be able to do what you personally cannot do. If it is wrong for the individual to do this A or B, it also should be wrong for government to do that. And also we've talked about, and I think this kind of hits towards that speech that you gave, whenever government is um, violating your property, they're actually committing a crime against you. Like when they, they're taxing you, that is committing the crime of stealing. When they pull you over because the, the some arbitrary rule of texting while driving, that is a property violation against you. Could you expand on that, the, on what you were talking about with the guilt and punishment for the crime of statism, and explain to us how the state is sincerely just like you going and holding somebody up with a gun the state is committing a crime against you well i think you've done very well in, in summarizing my position on that uh, uh the idea here is that people are just people and they don't get special powers when they call themselves government that is it's unjust for them to seize powers now, there are arguments uh, that, like, a majority voted for them, but, you know, there is such a thing as the tyranny of the majority. And uh, just because a group of people agree to something, well, let them do that on their own. Let them not coerce the minority into joining them. If people want to have socialized medicine, God bless them. Let them go do it and not force uh, people such as you and I uh, into it. If people want to have Social Security... Uh, or welfare, or whatever the, the government program is, let them, God bless them, let them do it uh, on their own hook, and let them do it with each other, and let them not force others of us who don't want to be part of their uh, schemes, uh, let them not compel us to join them. Hmm. You know, what you just said there, I think, is what sets you apart in so many ways. The way you explain, you're, we don't want to force anyone not to have their government, even. They want to have that, feel fine and dandy, and yet leave us alone. <laughs> I think that's fantastic because the um, libertarian side, they think, no, nope, we're not going to have this, that, or this, no matter what, and basically saying they're, they're guilty of forcing their belief or their position on how someone else can live. Because you're right, if they want to have their socialized medicine, God bless them, have at it. Yeah, now, you know, they say that if we don't like it, we should leave. Uh, I say, well, if they don't like justice, they should leave. You know, what gives them the right to say that we should leave just because we want to be inoffensive, non-offensive, and we don't want to coerce people? Uh, they're the bad guys here. Uh, they somehow think that the U.S. government or the Canadian government or the Mexican government or the French government whatever government is, sort of like a, a social club or a club, like a golf club. Now, if you join the golf club or the tennis club, you have to pay dues. And they think uh, implicitly and sometimes very explicitly that these governments are sort of like the golf or the tennis club and, and taxes are really dues. And, you know, since we joined the government, uh, we should pay our dues. And if we don't pay our dues, uh, we should not be allowed into the swimming pool or to the tennis court or whatever it is. But... Lysana Spooner was very clear that we didn't agree to this. We didn't agree to join the U.S. club or the Canadian club or whatever uh, group it is. If we did, then, uh, yes, then taxes would be uh, uh, unobtrusive, uh, unexceptionable, and, and we should pay them because that's just club dues. But the fact of the matter is we didn't join them. Now, in the U.S., 
in 1776 or a little bit before that, we had a session from England, but uh, and then they set up a new group called the U.S. government, but not everybody agreed. Only nine out of the 13 original colonies agreed, and there wasn't unanimity in any of these uh, 13 colonies. Uh, look, if you said that I owed you 100 bucks and we went to court, the judge, if he had any uh, uh, capacity, rational capacity or justice, would say, well, what evidence do you have for this $100 debt? Well, you know, th these people say that we joined their club and they have no evidence whatsoever. I, I didn't, I wasn't around in 1776. I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> and uh, my grandfather, uh, as far as I know, didn't agree to anything. And, and if people agreed to that in the modern era, well, I must have missed that committee meeting because <laughs> I was never invited. Uh, so the idea that the government is a voluntary social club, I think, has to be rejected by all rational people. I, I like that. I, you know, I I have yet to see a tennis club or a golf club or any or even a private pool go around and go door to door and take people's money to make them be a member. In fact, people have to apply. Yes. They have exactly. to. They have to want it. They have to request it. And if government was so great, you'd have people asking <coughs> to become a, a member of the government. You'd be, have people asking to participate. You'd have people asking for. Well, we we do in a situation where people are asking for it. The problem is they're also they're, inviting they're asking us. on our behalf. Yeah, what exactly. I'm saying is that they're not permitting us the opportunity to say no to that. It's kind of like the United States going and exporting democracy. Did we ask Iraq if they wanted to have a democratic form of government? Well, we freed them, Steve. Well, you know, there probably were some few Iraqis or Afghanis or whoever it was that requested uh, the U.S. government to come in and uh, get them democracy, but. Uh, they don't speak for all the Iraqis or all the Afghanis, and even if all the Iraqis and all the Afghanis uh, agreed uh, and wanted the U.S. government to go and help them uh, promote democracy or whatever, uh, even on a minimal government libertarian view, uh, let alone an anarcho-capitalist view, the, the sole function of the government in the United States is to protect Americans from aggression or whatever it is, not to uh, protect Iraqis or Afghanis. Uh, and if uh, some people in the United States want to help uh, people in foreign countries, they should do uh, as was done in the Spanish Civil War of 1936, uh, when you had this thing called the Lincoln Brigade, where Americans just went over to Spain and started fighting for, uh, I guess, for the communists. Uh, there were only the communists and the fascists fighting, but whoever it was, if they want to do that, you know, God bless them again. But uh, given that there's any legitimacy of the U.S. government, which I doubt, uh, which I think is not true, uh, the function of the U.S. government is to protect Americans, not to go and, um, you know, make the world safe for, for anything. But to get back to the anarchist point of view, uh, even the uh, limited government in the U.S., uh, say, as the proposed by Ron Paul and Ayn Rand and other uh, minimal government libertarians, is still unjust because we haven't agreed to it. Yeah. Now you're, you're a personal friend with Ron, aren't you? Well, I, I don't know if I'm a personal friend, but I certainly know him, and yeah. uh, we talk on the phone, and, uh, and I have a man crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> TMI, I <love> him. TMI. <laughs> I, I love him dearly. I, I don't know if it's fully reciprocated, but I, uh, he does invite me to speak at his functions, and I'm on the board of advisors of his new group. So, no, that's fantastic. Yes, I, I, I suppose I could be considered uh, a friend of his. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to clarify that, because what you said with the... Uh, because we have a lot of Ron Paul supporters, and that little tidbit that you said, they're going, oh, <gasps> shut the radio off. He just spoke blasphemy against Dr. Paul, which I know that you're not. And and I think that um, Ron Paul actually feels, well, I think this new thing that he's doing is going to show us a lot more of what he really believes about stuff. Now that he's completely out of the political realm, per se, he's going to be more open and free to, not that he wasn't already, but give it to us. I think Dr. Paul just said something, too, that's very informative about how a lot of people feel about Ron Paul. They have a man crush on him. <laughs> they, they, no, no, seriously, I think that there are an awful lot of people that are still looking to a savior. They're looking for someone else to stop, step up and tell us what to do. How can I be free? How can I 
what can I do? Tell me what to do. Well, my man crush, I didn't really mean uh, <laughs> that I look upon him as a savior. I mean, I do disagree with him on uh, a few things, but uh, what, maybe I should have said it uh, that I greatly admire him. I don't, I don't think Steve was pointing to you, no, per no, se. I mean, no, not, 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 I, what, that wasn't meant as a personal criticism. I'm just saying uh, I'm pointing people that we know. That, uh, there are an awful <laughs> lot of Ron Paul supporters that, that still fall into that same trap of, that's elect a good man. Well, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with electing a good man. Uh, I, uh, if I lived in Texas in the 14th uh, Congressional District, I certainly would have voted for him. I donated money to his campaigns, uh, whether for a congressman or for a president. Uh, there are some libertarians that say we should eschew uh, the political sphere. We should not become involved in politics. But to me, the example of Ron Paul uh, shows... You know, that on a utilitarian basis, uh, that's not a good strategy. I, I mean, to my way of thinking, uh, my own personal heroes in, in Austrian economics and libertarian theory were Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, but they didn't really convert millions of people to the libertarian banner. I would say of, of the, the people who converted most people to libertarianism, it would be Ayn Rand a generation ago or Ron Paul in, in the present generation. I give speeches all around, and sometimes I ask people, why are you here? Uh, and uh, I mention names, and Ron Paul is, is the person that you know most people have been converted to libertarianism on the basis of. So I, I think it's uh, not a good strategy to say that we should uh, uh, ignore politics, uh, as Murray Rothbard used to say. Every four years, people focus on politics, and why shouldn't we uh, get in on the bandwagon and try to promote liberty? So that's one reason, the utilitarian or the strategic reason. But another criticism is, well, there's something wrong deontologically, morally, or ethically with involving ourselves with politics, because politics is a, a dirty business or it's uh, per se wrong-headed. The example I like to use is, uh, suppose... Uh, we're a bunch of slaves, and the slave master, uh, the, the owner, said we could we could vote for a slave master Goody, who would only beat us up once a week, or a slave master uh, uh, Batty, who beat the crap out of us every hour on the hour, and we voted for uh, you know uh, overseer Goody. Does that mean we support slavery? Does that mean we're uh, uh, morally involved in slavery? No, I don't think so. It's a defense. It's sort of like if a hoodlum comes up to you with a gun and says, give me your money or I'll plug you, and you give me a wallet, it doesn't mean that you support uh, robbery. It doesn't mean that if you vote for uh, uh, Ron Paul that you support every uh, act that any government has ever done. It just means uh, defensively, according to Spooner, uh, again, uh, you know, you're voting for the lesser of two evils, and I don't see that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, any more wrong than giving a hold-up man your wallet. Well, it's a little bit different with the hold-up man, because when you're voting for the lesser of the two evils, you're uh, giving your consent to it. Well, I don't think you're giving consent. Uh, um, I, I mean, uh, when you give your money to the hold-up man, you're not really consenting to it, you're doing it under duress. So I think that if you vote, you can be said to be doing it under duress. For example, I supported uh, Obama vis-a-vis -vis, um, Romney in the last election. I didn't vote for him because I was too lazy, but if I would have voted, I would have voted for Obama. Uh, not that I favor him very much, but I thought that uh, on, on uh, foreign policy, which I regard as more important than economic policy or personal liberties, he was slightly better than Romney. I thought Romney would be nuking people or, you know, getting involved in all sorts of military adventurism. No doubt. So, so uh, you, you can never tell. I mean, Romney might have been better than Obama. At least Obama hasn't gone into Syria, although uh, he, you know, he, he's not as good as... I mean, if, uh, if Ron Paul were president, that would be magnificent. So I don't think there's any that you commit a violation of libertarianism by voting for the lesser of two evils any more than you do by uh, giving your wallet up to the mugger uh, under duress. But um, hang on a second, Walter. I mean, this is Steve Floyd. I'm, I'm just the button pusher here. But I've got to tell you, I have, I'm, I'm sitting here chewing on this, and I think I see the hole in your analogy. Because you're not, by, by giving someone your wallet when they ask you, that is an act, that is a defensive motion. By voting, what you're doing is you are asking someone else to go and commit the robbery. It's like if the robber came up and put his gun to your head 
and said, I want you to go and rob someone else. You have a moral choice at that point to either take the bullet or commit an act of thievery. All right, good, ide good ideas don't require force. Well, I think you make a, a very important point uh, that you're giving sanction to the state by, by voting for them. But the problem with that, as I see it, is uh, we have the reductio ad absurdum argument against your very well thought uh, point. And that is that we give our sanction to the government in so many other ways. For example, I right now have U.S. currency in my wallet, even uh, currency involved with the Fed and central banking, even though I oppose the Fed and central banking. The other day I mailed a letter in the U.S. post office, even though I oppose the U.S. post office. Uh, to get to work today, I used a, a, a public uh, road, a public highway, even though I oppose public highways. Uh, there, I, I once went to a, a public museum. Uh, so what you're saying, in effect, is uh, that to be uh, a pure libertarian, you should have nothing to do with the state at all, which means either you become a hermit somewhere uh, and self-sufficient or you commit suicide. And I don't think that libertarianism requires you not to be involved with the state. I think that the state is a, a gigantic mugger with good public relations because they've hired a whole bunch of intellectuals to say how great they are. And that uh, if I want to use the, the public street or to use the post office, uh, look, they stole the money from me <laughs> to do that. So, uh, yes, in one sense, I'm giving sanction to them. Uh, Ayn Rand said you should never give sanction to the state. But on the other hand, I think we're entirely justified in doing all these things, and I don't see any real difference between voting for a lesser evil and giving sanction to the government in this, these other four or five ways that I've just mentioned. Hmm. Except for the fact that it's evil. <laughs> yes, no. but, but it's evil to use the post office, because the post office yes, shouldn't be a, a government post office. It should be private, like the Wells Fargo or the Pony Express. And All right, but it, it, at least with the post office, you do have an option. There's UPS, and there's FedEx, and those are private types. But if you do use it, I, the, only, the only difference I see in it is that when you participate in the political process or do the voting is that you're not making a decision for yourself you're making a decision for someone else but you also gave us another false choice when you were saying you can either become a hermit or commit suicide you could do another thing like Lysander Spooner who you talked about instead of just simply resisting the post office and saying I'm not going to use it because it's evil he created the American letter mail company he went out well, there and directly competed with the post office. He had people who he issued his own stamps. People would come and pay money. He would give the letter to a messenger who would take it physically to the other city and deliver it hand. It's very much like what FedEx does today. He well, directly competed. Well, I certainly support Lysander Spooner, but I don't think that it's incumbent upon every libertarian to uh, start his own post office. Let me take a hack at this in a different way. Sure. Uh, no, we're not trying to beat up on you either. Cause no, we no, love no, you. no. Look, we're, just, uh, we're just talking. We're trying to get to the truth of things, and I don't have a monopoly of truth. You know, I'm just uh, uh, another libertarian that's trying to make sense of this, and, you know, if you can convince me, I'll, I'll change my mind. Uh, <laughs> But uh, let me take another hack at this. Um, and, you know, so I certainly don't take it personally. Rather, you know, I don't want you to just ask me questions and then you say, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Good old, uh, esteemed, yeah. wonderful Professor Block, we agree with you <laughs> entirely. It's much more interesting if we uh, get it on and, you know, discuss these things. Certainly. So let, let me get to this other way of looking at it. Okay. I like the uh, Nuremberg trials. Yes. The Nuremberg trials were a great thing. Uh, not every bit of it. I don't think Germany was solely responsible for World War II or anything like that. But the idea that uh, if you're following orders from the German high command, then therefore you're innocent. And what the Nuremberg trial established was, you know, that that's not so. So in terms of Bradley Manning or um, uh, Edward Snowden, I think that if, if we had a libertarian Nuremberg trial, uh, those guys would be seen as the heroes that they are. Yeah. But now let's, let's suppose that... Um, uh, we libertarians take over, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, North Korea, or, or the U.S., or any other country. Who goes to jail? Who gets uh, executed? Every citizen of the United States, or every citizen of, uh, uh, of North Korea, or anyone who's ever used the post office? Do we consider him uh, akin to a criminal, or everyone who's ever voted? I don't think so. 
I think what we do is we look at the ruling class, the, the chief politicians, the chief supporters of the government. Uh, but, I mean, virtually every citizen or every resident of the United States has used uh, fiat currency, has used the highways, has used the post office. So when you say, well, yes, Spooner set up his own uh, postal company, the implication is that if you don't, uh, you're guilty of some sort of crime, and I find that hard to uh, uh, acknowledge. So I, I don't think pe everyone who has ever used the post office, or who's ever voted or anything like that, is a criminal. That, but that's no. my, that was my point, though, is that it is another option. It is not simply the dichotomy choice that you gave us of either submit to the state and use their stuff or go and commit suicide. It, it, it's not you have the other option of directly competing. You don't have to go and withdraw. You don't have to go out there and do what they say. No, but, but even Spooner uh, used the uh, U.S. currency, Spooner used the highways. I mean, what I meant was if you want to totally divorce yourself from the government, you have to either commit suicide or become a hermit. Yeah, I guess you're right on that part because we do use different avenues that the state has put on us. I think the only the difference that I see it is that those things are basically... How uh, do I, I drive some, anymore? I hear some music. Yeah, it's, it's, you hear Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye in the background. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the Fox News here at the bottom we of the We have hour. one minute of news. And I'm We've got okay. uh, Walter, Walter Block on the phone. If you'd like to call in and be a part of the conversation, 458-TALK is the number. And welcome back to Patriots of the Men's right here on KFAR. It's local talk or radio. I'm Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio. Joining us in the studio, as always, from Bighorn Enterprises. We have uh, Josh Bennett in from the Once in the Future, Far North Tactical. We have Aaron Bennett. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. We also have another person of indeterminate national background somewhere in the studio today. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning. And joining us on the line, we've got Dr. Walter Block. Hey, we were just mentioning that uh, we can't believe that we're actually arguing with Dr. <laughs> Block. <laughs> uh, you, on, you on there, Block? No, uh, arguing is good. Uh, uh, if you want to get at the truth, I don't know how else you do it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm friends with uh, Robert Higgs on Facebook, and um, one of our good friends, uh, Jim O'Connor, he was commenting to me that, because I always seem to find an argument with Robert Higgs, he's like, you're the only guy that argues with the anarchists that he's not anarchist enough. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel that's where we're at right now. Are you kidding me? You are not anarchist <laughs> enough for us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think uh, the way the way I see kind of what you're saying is uh, the one of the things that uh, one of the from it's Murray not, Rothbard. Not John I'm sorry, Jordan. I was just talking on break. Murray Rothbard in his do uh, do you hate the state? And I think one of his points is kind of what your point is. We should do everything and anything we can nonviolently to eradicate the state so if you have someone proposing that taxes get cut in half next year yes let's support that we want taxes to be cut in half but at the same time always holding to the ultimate goal of no taxation and the goal of let's have smaller government support the guy that says yes i will eradicate the department of education or this and that so yes we support that with the ultimate goal of eradicating the state Yes, uh, that's that's why they call me Walter Moderate Block. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I like when you read uh, towards the towards the libertarian theory of guilt and punishment for the crime of statism, I wouldn't necessarily say that's very moderate at all. That's well, it's just uh, trying to apply ordinary punishment theory to uh, people who uh, get puffed up and call themselves government employees. And what I'm trying to do is treat them just the way they would be if they did the same thing as private individuals. Yeah, we, we've used the Nuremberg trials many times on this show. Yeah, there is a higher law, basically, is what that came down to. Um, right, the higher law is the libertarian law, and we're, and we're applying the higher law to government officials. Yep. Right, the state is not God. That's what was decided at the Nuremberg trial. Right. It's doing my duty. <laughs> Back to the, the voting thing. The, the only thing I disagree is that I just see that voting is just making other people's decisions for them. That's the reason why. we, we actually, My brother and I actually ran for borough government a couple of years ago and then came to the decision that, well, if we were in there, we'd be making decisions for people that didn't agree with us, so how could we do that? And I actually broke with my no voting and joined the Republican, Par <coughs> ah, 
Republican Party so I could vote for Ron Paul, specifically because I wanted to, when he came for the state uh, convention or whatever, and specifically because I thought I saw it as an ideal way to promote his values and promote libertarianism and things like that. And because at that time, I thought the more people that show his support will legitimize his theory more. But anyways... And then well, look, I, this, uh, this idea of making decisions for other people, I, I think we do that all the time. Uh, I buy a loaf of bread, and what I did is I raised the price of bread very, very slightly, and therefore everyone else who buys bread has to pay a little bit more because of the fact that I uh, bought bread. Well, let me give you another example. Uh, I'm in 1943, and what I do is I break into a Nazi... Uh, uh, garage, and I start uh, 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 blowing up their tanks. And now I'm making decisions for all sorts of other people because there, there might be other uh, Germans who are also against the Nazis and want to sell those tanks and uh, privatize them and you know get the money back to the people. I'm also making decisions for them. So I think that when you say making decisions for other people as the criteria of libertarianism, I think that's wrong. The, the, the criteria of libertarianism is do you directly initiate violence against someone else? And uh, if I vote for Ron Paul, I don't see how I'm initiating violence against anyone else. Look, when I gave the, uh, that mugger uh, my wallet because he uh, held a gun at my stomach, now he has more money. He can buy more guns, and he can uh, rob other people, and, and therefore I've, in effect, made decisions for other people that they're less safe because I gave this guy uh, money. So uh, according to that criteria, when the mugger comes, I should say, well, you know, F you, I'm not giving you any money, because if I do, then I'll be, in effect, making decisions for other people. So I think this idea of making decisions for other people is uh, problematic as a D criterion for what libertarianism is. Hmm. We are it bringing is. on another line right now. Uh, along with us, we've got uh, Jim from Kenai on as well. Jim, are you there? Hello, this is Jim. All right, hey, great. You know, like I understand what you're saying. I guess the the, re the way that I see it differently, and Ron Paul's the booger in the woods, I guess, because he's messing up everything. <laughs> 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 is that? Uh, the government is the is an institution of force and violence, and when I when I buy a loaf of bread, I voluntarily buy that loaf, and someone else doesn't have to buy that loaf. But when I involve myself with the government, it forces people to be involved with it. It forces people to, and, it's, and their daily choices, their daily lives are dictated by the government. Of course, we can all say, well, we can ultimately resist it and choose something else or just not go along with it and get thrown in jail or whatever i just see it as the difference being there are voluntary associations that you can make that do not necessarily affect someone else because they can voluntarily participate in that too whereas government whether you like it or not sucker you're stuck with this right voluntarily buying a loaf of bread and the other person has a choice not to i don't think you can compare that to the the compulsion of the state well, you can compare it just in the sense that you're affecting other people's lives. I only meant it in that uh, limitation. Look, I once ran for uh, office, too. I, I didn't win. Uh, I ran for the New York State Assembly, which is the lower house of New York State. And had I been elected, I would have voted against everything. You know, I would have been Dr. No, uh, just like Ron Paul. And I don't see how, by doing that, by just asking people to, you know, give me money or vote for me, and then by going to Albany and, and voting against everything, I would be initiating violence against anyone. It seems to me that I would be reducing the violence that the state is committing against people. Well, uh, what I see with that point is, I still can't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Think it through, go ahead, I'm speak slowly, you can do it, John. What I see that is different towards is that... Um, when you go okay when you go down to vegas i've never have but if you go there and you gamble and you win or lose you decide you voluntarily did that and you accept and sanction that you lost and when you're voting you're sanctioning who people are voting for it when you lose like when i ran for a borough mayor everyone said that guy is a nut job we're in, or not mayor but assembly you're a nut job you lost fair and square so what this guy's doing now which is totally against every libertarian value you sanctioned it because you said if i don't win 
then I agree with... You don't have a right to complain because you went ahead you and... You threw the you, dice. Because you, you, you gambled. gambled. Well, I, I, I think you do have a right to complain, and if, I don't think that sanctioning is, uh, per se, a, a criminal act, because we sanction the government every time we use the post office or every time we use a, a museum or, or, or something like that. Uh, the question, uh, I, I think, we, you know, in sports they say you have to keep your eye on the ball. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't keep your eye on the ball in a, in a sport that has a ball, not, not like track or swimming, uh, you're going to go off, uh, you're not going to do as well as you can. Now, to me, the ball in libertarianism is, do you uh, invade other people? Do you violate their rights? Do you aggress against other people? And, and you people are substituting something else for that. You're talking about sanctioning. Uh, which is not exactly the same thing as initiating violence against. You're talking about affecting other people. That's why I come up with, you know, buying or selling bread or something like that, mm -hmm. or using the post office. I mean, we sanction the government in so many, many ways. Jim, feel but free look, to step you know, in I, 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 I think you're wrong when you say that if you vote for uh, uh, Overseer uh, Goody and Overseer Batty wins, then somehow you you have to support Overseer Batty or you can't complain against Overseer Batty. You can still complain about Overseer Batty even though you voted for Overseer Goody. You don't have to say, well, I vote. You see, Spooner uh, deals with that. He says, just because you voted doesn't mean that you support the winner of the election because right. the whole thing is a fraud. The whole thing but is... The Hans Hopp would call it giving your tacit support at the, at the very minimum. Giving tacit support is not the same thing as initiating violence against innocent people. Again, I resist the notion of changing the libertarian essence. Giving tacit support is not the per se uh, uh, aspect of libertarianism. We have to be very clear on what libertarianism is. And, and giving tacit support, look, I gave tacit support to that criminal when I gave him my wallet. And, and therefore, I'm a, a criminal but because I gave up my wallet to the mugger? Do, it, does, the, does the state primarily hinge on consent? No, the, the state uh, hinges on uh, on initiatory violence. But but it, it, in order to maintain the position of of initiating violence, how does how does it maintain that position in society? Oh, you're you're quite right. The state has to have some sort of legitimacy. I mean, if uh, if ninety percent of the people hated the state, and wouldn't pay taxes, you wouldn't have much of a state. So, so what is what is the biggest tool of maintaining consent? Well, the biggest tool of maintaining consent, I think, is the intellectuals who've been bought by uh, by the ruling class, uh, the the media, the academics. Not me. <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, the mainstream academics and and journalists and and people on radio and TV. Uh, that's uh, they've bamboozled the public into thinking that the government is legitimate, or at least it's a necessary evil, or something like that. I, I think I, I, mean, I personally, I love this discussion. I'm not sure this is really what's best for listeners, but I love this discussion because it's my opinion that the thing that makes I have to, I kind of agree with Hoppe here that the thing which makes the state so much more aggressive in the West is that we have the the illusion of participation. And, and so I'll vote for anything that delegitimizes the government. If they put up a law to repeal the law of gravity, I'll vote for that law <laughs> because it mocks the suckers. I voted for Ron Paul, and I would do it again even for the office of president, which I don't think should exist because Ron Paul aggressed was for a uniform rollback of aggression. I would vote for Walter Block because Walter Block is for the uniform rollback of aggression. But every other lesser evil that we're supposed to vote for is always for shifting aggression away from me onto somebody else, and I'm not in favor of on somebody else. Well, like, take the case of Rand Paul, who's no Ron Paul. Uh, uh, I, on my libertarian meter, I gave Ron a 97 out of 100 because I disagree with him on three things. I think immigration and abortion and something else, I forgot what. Uh, I only gave Rand Paul a 70. Uh, now, look, I'm not going to write a book. Uh, I wrote a book about how great Ron Paul was. I'm not going <laughs> to write a book about how great Rand Paul is. But uh, Rand Paul is easily the most uh, uh, libertarian of the senators and maybe the most libertarian of any congressman. Uh, if I had a choice of, of um, I don't know, Chuck Schumer or Rand Paul or something like that, or uh, I, I mean, it's not even close. Uh, Chuck Schumer on the Libertarian meter gets a 5 or a 10. Rand on my Libertarian meter gets a 70. 
yes, I am tacitly supporting uh, government by by voting for Rand Paul, but tacit support for is not the same thing as the, the non-aggression principle. And I resist the notion that we misconstrue libertarianism or hijack libertarianism or maybe I should be more politic or more <laughs> moderate here. No. Uh, uh, misconstrue libertarianism into giving tacit support for giving tacit support for is not a crime. And the Nuremberg people shouldn't put people in jail for giving tacit support. And, and if somebody votes for uh, uh, Rand Paul, I, I don't think he's a criminal. Whereas if you uh, interpret uh, things the way you guys are interpreting, or some of you, uh, uh, you're going to make into actual criminals uh, people who support Rand Paul, which I think is highly problematic. I, I think mm -hmm. it's less. I think it's less um, effective. I, you know, if the state if the state is drowning, do you give it a rope? No, you you let it drown. And um, and, and I see voting voting for the lesser evil is, is throwing it a rope. And I just well, the sucker went went under. Well, we have to distinguish between utilitarianism and strategy on the one hand, and deontology on the other hand. This is true. Now, I'm talking about deontology rights. Are you a criminal by by giving tacit support to the government? I say no. Is it wise to do that? That's an entirely different issue, and there I'm not so sure. Hmm. Uh, uh, there it's really an empirical issue as to which tactics and strategy will work best to undermine the government. Uh, and I wasn't so concerned about that. You might well be right that this is not a good way to go. Uh, I was more concerned about, is it a rights violation per se? Okay. And there, I think I'm on stronger ground. Yeah, okay. I can actually, uh, I, see, I see your point now with that, now that you... Especially going back to the Nuremberg thing and thinking that through, you couldn't hang all the citizens of Germany just because they tacitly supported the Nazi regi regime. It was the Nazis themselves that were held accountable, rightfully so. And Look, every, every so, German that didn't try to assassinate Hitler tacitly supported him. Yeah. We're not going to... I'm not going to think that they're all criminals. Right. I guess maybe maybe our uh, definition tacit, wasn't clear also. Tacit support is an important issue, but it's not the essence of libertarianism, and I don't think it should be uh, seen as the essence of libertarianism. The essence of libertarianism is the non-aggression principle. We got, we got caught up in not defining our terms mm -hmm. at <laughs> the very beginning. And I guess one of the things that we do here on our little... Let's a, it's a teeny, teeny little radio show. We got seventy thousand people that live in the whole million square mile That's area like of interior. More than oh, hundred thousand. Yeah. In interior of Alaska, and one of the things with our um, being against voting, one of my reasons is because everyone I talk to is like the only a way to make effective change is to vote, and so that's kind of turned me off completely. Saying no, government keeps going, and they're still here because you keep voting, because you keep going in there and, and you feel like, Americans are the worst of that. The only way to affect change is to vote. That's that's all we think about. Well, well next that's four a, years, the next four years. That's and, a strategy uh, with which I don't agree. I mean, mm -hmm. Ron Paul did affect, uh, did do that, and he mainly got publicity, but Ayn Rand never voted for anybody, or I, I don't know if she voted for anybody, but she never ran for office, and she converted a lot of libertarians. In my own case, uh, I did run for New York State Assembly, but that was in 1969. <laughs> uh, honest, I haven't done anything like that for a long time. <laughs> my own contribution, as you people know, I'm a professor of economics. Uh, I uh, uh, give public speeches. I, I write books. Uh, so I'm more of an intellectual. Uh, but there are other ways, like the Free State Project, the way of gathering libertarians. There's uh, all sorts of uh, think tanks, like the Mises Institute. And by the way, when you say that this radio broadcast will only go to 100,000 people, I'm intending to put this on LewRockwell.com, and they get millions of listeners there, literally millions. So awesome. This uh, conversation, I think, uh, hopefully will soon be broadcast on LewRockwell.com and on, on several other uh, media uh, so th there are many, many ways to uh, promote liberty. There are many, many ways to fight uh, for the non-aggression principle. Voting uh, certainly isn't the only way. That's just silly. Whether voting is a good way as an empirical issue, I'm not sure. 
but I am sure only of the fact that it's not a crime. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's. I think we were we're misunderstanding you. So I guess I, I do now, though. I can agree with point of uh, it's the strategy, like Ron Paul, for example, because I was from I went from supporting Bush, then I discovered Ron Paul one day in one video, in a YouTube video, and instantly I became a libertarian. And start to study that and uh, progress to being an anarcho capitalist. Um, I can get that point, and uh, and I think the no government is uh, is a goal, which is hard to get to, but it has to always to be the goal, uh, the ultimate goal, to for us to strive to get to. But it, you're always going to have somebody that wants to be in charge. You're always going to have people that wants to follow. Look at what Martin Luther King Jr. did. When he, moti when he went out and got people together to resist the, the laws in the South, laws, by, by the way, which were in, put in place by government, they, they were put in place by the will of the people down there in the South, he didn't go down there with force, he didn't go down there with voting, he went and he sat down and obstructed and made them deal with him and made them to show themselves the bullies that they really are. Instead of going and participating for in the process, instead of running for office, instead I mean, he basically went and got himself arrested by resisting these stupid things that the government was doing. Well, I'm not as big a fan of Martin Luther King uh, as I might be. I'm uh, with regard to the black community. I'm much more a fan of Malcolm X. Nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Martin Luther King. Uh, Martin Luther King was a socialist and. Uh, like, take the uh, Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Rand Paul initially got this correct, and, and Ron Paul always got this correct, namely, there were certain parts of that uh, legislation that were good, namely uh, giving uh, everyone the right to vote. Uh, not that anyone should have the right to vote, but if whites have the right to vote, then black people certainly should. But this idea of sitting in on private lunch counters, that's a violation of property rights. Uh, I, I think that... Uh, you know, he, uh, like protesting, say, the law that you have to, uh, blacks must uh, ride in the back of the bus and things like that, that's perfectly legitimate. But why doesn't a uh, southerner uh, who owns a lunch counter, Woolworths or whoever it was, why don't they have a right to say who should be in their, uh, uh, in their lunch counter and who should not be? Absolutely, uh, they do. Yep. So uh, Martin Luther King, uh, I mean, he was very good on foreign policy. He was against the U.S. side in the Vietnam War, and he did other good things. But I think that libertarianism has to take him with a grain of salt, because he had a very uh, uh, unclear appreciation, uh, if any appreciation at all, for uh, uh, the rights of segregation, voluntary segregation, the rights of discrimination, and the rights of private property. Yeah. Uh, isn't the key issue, can the state be limited? If it were limited, would it still be moral? And then how do we, how do we eliminate it? Those are, the, those are really the key issues. That's a good question. Murray, Murray, Murray Rothbard was a great moderate, too. He yes. said he'd be willing to go back to the budget of George Washington uh, as an interim staff. Uh, <laughs> well, he's a compromiser. He's a real, uh, you know, punk compromiser. <laughs> So I, I think, uh, you know, the only just government is no government at all, but far better a limited government than, than a, a fascist, communist government uh, of the sort that uh, the U.S. is now uh, approaching. What do you think when people say, because I hear this, we hear this all the time, we, the people that call up even, we've got to get back to the Constitution, or we need to just get back to the, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the getting back to the Constitution is a step in the right direction, because the Constitution in many ways was very good, except when the Supreme Court interprets it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole other issue. But uh, Lysanne Spooner's most famous book was The Constitution of No Authority. Right. So from an anarchist point of view, the, the Constitution is a step in the right direction compared to what we now have, but compared to what uh, the uh, just society would be the libertarian society. We wouldn't have a, a constitution. We wouldn't have a government because uh, you know we're all anarchists now. Right. What do you? What are your thoughts on? The, and I'm asking this sincerely for help. Every Saturday when we have our show, people call and they say, "What do we do then? We hear what you guys don't like. Give us some ideas. What do we do to 
make actual change, affect actual change, what are real world steps that we can do to go towards what you're talking about? Well, we educate ourselves about liberty. We read uh, Murray Rothbard and, and Von Mises. We, uh, we go to lewrockwell.com. Uh, we uh, become educated. We try to uh, promote liberty in any way we can. Uh, if we can be professional libertarians, speakers, uh, writers, uh, professors, that's good. If not, we can donate money to the cause. We can uh, donate money to there are 50 uh, state libertarian think tanks. Uh, there are some think tanks uh, in Washington, D.C. that aren't as bad as Cato. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I waiting for that. <laughs> I, I don't uh, favor Cato, but I favor other libertarian think tanks, the Free State Project. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Uh, there are many, many ways of seasteading. Uh, th there are lots of ways to promote liberty and politics, too. There's the Libertarian Party. We haven't discussed the Libertarian Party. I'm a fan of theirs as well. But not all of us uh, are libertarians. I'm, I'm more personally of an anarchist. I eschew all labels. <laughs> well, I don't eschew labels. I, I, I proudly uh, call myself a moderate anarchist. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys a question. You, you, you're uh, broadcasting from Fox. Now, Fox, is my understanding, is more conservative, not libertarian. How are they tolerating you people? Uh, I don't think they know about us. Actually, no. Uh, okay, <laughs> I, I won't tell them. Josh <laughs> buys the airtime, and the station will sell to anybody with cash. Yes. Ah, yeah. We okay. are we are true voluntarists here at the radio station. And speaking as a radio station employee, I can tell you that anybody that wants to buy some airtime, all you got to do is email me. We'll set you up, and we will <laughs> <laughs> be happy to sell you an hour or two. Yeah, we basically oh. buy two hours a week to come on here. Well, and Wow. This is really magnificent, because the only major person that I know of, uh, Stossel and, and uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, who are pr I'm a, much more of a fan of uh, Napolitano than Stossel. Stossel mm -hmm. is good on, you know, consumer stuff, but a little weak on all the spying and, and the foreign policy and stuff. But th these two are the best people, and they're both on Fox, but the rest of the Fox people are pretty horrible. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we... <laughs> Pretty much don't listen to this station. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to help our ratings. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. Not only that, I bet my the fee just went up. Good. That's exactly. We're going to have to renegotiate now. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Block, for being on with us here today. I want to give you an opportunity to plug anything that you personally are working on. If you've got a website or a blog. Well, uh, WalterBlock.com. I've got uh, a book on Ron Paul. I've got a book on privatizing the... Uh, Roads and highways, uh, defending the undefendable. I've written about 20 books. Um, uh, uh, Google me and, and buy my books and, and support the Mises Institute and also Loyola University, where I teach. Uh, we've got a lot of free enterprises here, so if you want a good college education, come to Loyola University. Yeah, and also you're on Lou Rockwell a lot, louRockwell.com. Yes, yes. And um, the Mises Institute, people remember you can go there, and a lot of Dr. Block's or Walter stuff is on there. You can download for free. It's great. Thank you very much. I could talk to you for four years straight. And thank you for calling in today and being a part of the show. This has been Patriots Lament online at patriotslament.blogspot.com and on the YouTube channel, Radio Free Fairbanks. Email address? Patriotslament at gmail.com. See you next week. Thank you.